Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. In this episode, I'll be reviewing two more wines from Pasqua that my good friends over at Creative Palette sent to me. You may remember during my visit at Provine last year, I did an interview with Alessandro Pasqua, and well, I've got two more wines from them. Before we get started, you've hopefully noticed a name change that has already occurred. The new show will be called Wine World TV. This episode and next week's episode are free sample reviews that I need to complete before making the official switch to the new show. Since these are summer wines and the new show is slated to launch October 5th, I, I kind of need to get these done. So uh, there will be one more show after next week, and that will be my final show as Leet Wine TV. I'll go into more detail as to why I'm ending Leet Wine TV and what to expect from WWTV. You may or may not be able to tell that I'm using a teleprompter right now. <laughs> For show intros, I'll be doing that to help streamline things. I was playing this even before the name change. I've already implemented it in my behind the scenes channel. And this is actually the first episode I've done it with this on Leet Wine TV. For my reviews, it'll be for my intro and any info I need to give you for the wines to be reviewed. This episode and next week's episode are kind of a preview of WWTV's format. Though I'm still working it all out in my head and basically how I'm going to execute it. Think of these two episodes as an extremely rough draft of the new show. Okay, so normally this is where I would tell you about the winery, but as per usual, I've kind of already covered all that in the interview with Alessandro or prior episodes. So feel free to check those out. So yes, that means all Leet Wine TV shows are still on the actual channel. Let's just get to the wines. First up, we have the non vinches Pasqua Passione e Sentimento Prosecco Treves Treviso Spumante Brut. It's a lot. Part of the Romeo and Juliet line of wines I reviewed a few weeks ago. This is their Prosecco and the suggested retail price is 16 bucks. On the label is a photograph from Gio Martirana of Juliet's Courtyard, which features graffiti adorning the 20 foot wall leading to the house, complete with balcony. Credited by local Veronese as being Juliet's home in Capello Street. Not sure if I mentioned it before, but it should be in my interview from last year at least. This is 100% Glera. Glera is the official name of the Prosecco grape. Now, Prosecco was traditionally used as the name for both the grape variety and the sparkling wine pr produced primarily from it. There were three DOCs and an IGG that used the name Prosecco, and when the higher DOCG status was sought for what's known as Prosecco di Conigliano e Valdobbiadene, it became a complication that the grape, which had been cultivated over a large area, and the protected designation of origin, or PDO, uh, had the same name. So to resolve this issue within the EU, the old synonym Glera was officially adopted for the variety at the same time as the DOCG was approved in 2009. The change was also made to reduce the possibility of sparkling wines of other origins from being labeled Prosecco by using the grape variety's name. So let's take a look at the area. This is a kind of a new thing. So this is the broader area of Veneto. The Pasqua winery is in Verona. And here is their winery. Treviso is over here. And 
and the grapes for this wine come from north of Treviso. They are all hillside grown in the premium Conigliano subzone of Treviso. Here are the stats for the wine. So first, it's non-vintage. The suggested retail price is 16 bucks. The grape is 100% Glera. It was harvested in mid-September. Alcohol by volume is 11%. The pH is 3.27. Total acidity is 5.3 grams per liter. The residual sugar is 10.8 grams per liter. And the sparkling method used is Charmat. So what is the Charmat method? Glad you asked. It was developed and patented in 1895 by the Italian Federico Martinotte. Uh, he lived from 1860 to 1924. It's also known as Metodo Martinotte. The method was further developed with a new patent by the inventor Eugene Charmat in 1907. The method is now named after the latter, but is also called Cuvée Close, Metodo Italiano, or the tank method. The wine is mixed in a stainless steel pressure tank together with sugar and yeast. When the sugar is converted into alcohol and carbon dioxide, the yeast is filtered and removed, and the wine is bottled. The duration of fermentation affects the quality. The longer the fermentation preserves the wine's aromas better and gives finer or more durable bubbles. So this production method is widely used in the U.S., Italy, especially in the Aussie province and in Prosecco wines, and in Germany to produce cheap variants of sect. Charmet method sparkling wines can be produced at a considerably lower cost than the traditional method wines like Champagne. This is why Prosecco and other sparkling wines made this way can be sold for relatively low cost, typically between 10 and 20 bucks. This Charmette method sparkling wine remains in the tank for 60 days. Now that's double the aging period typically identified with production of Prosecco, thus facilitating development of tiny, more persistent bubbles, resulting in what's called an elegant perlage. So let's get into the wine. All right. Now I get to riff. Did you like all that? Um, Do you like all that teleprompter stuff? I'm super excited to do this wine. I've had this wine for a little while, and you know, I really need to make sure that you know these free samples I'm doing in a reasonable amount of time. So there we go. That really wanted to pop out. All right. That's pretty aromatic, too. All right, here we go. So on the nose, I get more fruit really than anything else. Kind of a green apple, really crisp, slightly underripe. You can kind of smell the bubbles. You can smell the carbonation, the CO2. So you're getting kind of the gas from that. Touch of like orange peel. Little lemon. So green apple, orange peel, lemon. Yeah, those are the primary aromas that I'm getting. A touch of white flowers. So, I mean, very pleasant uh, aroma or pleasant nose. Let's uh, taste the wine. Wine tastes really good. So I continue to get that green apple uh, flavor, but it's also kind of like, kind of like the, those, those green apple, like hard candy things. There's kind of a bit like that. It's not sweet, but there is a little bit of extra residual sugar in here. We're still in the brute range uh, since it's below 12 grams per liter. But with the 10, 10 or so grams per liter sugar on it, you're definitely getting um, a little bit of sweetness, but it's not a sweet Prosecco, at least not to me, by any means. It's really delicious. So the green apple I've already mentioned, the orange is still there, not so much on the lemon, there is a bit of toasty brioche, but it's really faint. It really hasn't had 
So where, where you get that brioche from is really from Lee's contact, and you really only get that from traditional or champagne method. But there is a bit of toastiness to it. I don't know if that's maybe from the grape. Maybe the Charmant method's kind of giving that. It's not like it's necessarily rested on Lee's for months and months and months. However, it was in the tank for eight, uh, 60 days. So maybe a little bit of that autolysis got into the wine, or I might be just kind of looking for it. There's, a, there's a, some other type of aroma and flavor. I can't really put my nose, uh, finger on it, or my nose. It's very pasta-like. It's a really pleasant wine. For 16 bucks, it's totally crushable. I would absolutely just love to sip on this. Earlier today, I sipped on some German sect, and this kind of reminds me of that, of that wine. Just really easy to drink, really refreshing, perfect for summertime. Hey, you can drink this all year round, but it's summer. This type of wine is great for summertime. All right, back to our teleprompter. <laughs> All right, so our next wine is the 2019 Pasqua 11 Minutes uh, Rosé. The suggested retail price is 20 bucks on this. Now, the grapes come from the eastern and southern shores of Lake Garda, and I'll show you that right now. Here are the stats for this wine. Vintage again, 2019, the retail price is 20 bucks. The grapes that are used is 50% Corvina, 25% Trebbiano, 15% Syrah, and 10% Carmenere. I'm kind of st stoked about that. Harvesting period is also mid-September. The alcohol is 12.5%. pH is 3.1, total city 5.8 grams per liter, and the residual sugar is six grams per liter. So it's dry, but not sweet. The 11 minutes refer to the length of skin contact uh, that happens in order to get this color. Next, the must is cooled and transferred to a stainless steel tank where it remains there for about 11 hours. The necessary time for the more solid parts of the camp. And according to the ancient Roman poet Catullus, who I've read and translated, whose family is from near Lake Garda, 11 minutes is the optimal time for a physical contact between lovers. Sorry, I'm a little cheesy on that. After transferring again, the must is inoculated with selected yeasts and fermentation begins. Uh, temperature range is maintained between 15 and 16 degrees Celsius. That's 55 to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, during fermentation, the condition of the yeast in the wine, as well as the development of the entire metabolic process, are monitored daily. Once alcoholic fermentation is concluded, the wine remains in contact with the lees for about three to four months. Then the wine is filtered and bottled to be on the market in January following the harvest. So, what do all the grape varieties bring to the table? All right, so Corvina, which is the main grape for Amarone, that will bring floral aromas and acidity. Trebbiano will bring elegance and long finish. Syrah will bring fruit and spice, and Carmenere, which is one of my favorite grapes, adds structure and stability over time. All right, so let's get into the wine. All right. So this has got one of those glass stoppers. Glass toppers are cool. The only bummer with this is I can't use my Coravin on it. So I'm going to have to drink this pretty quick. And luckily, this glass stopper was easy to get out. Some of them are really hard to get out. And what I'll do is I'll use the knife portion, the foil cutter on my wine key. And I didn't bring it over here in advance. But that's okay. I was able to get this out. All righty. So a fairly like copperish color on it. I know with the red and all that's kind of hard to really see the color right. But kind of a copperish color. There's actually a little bit of spritz in there. Now, I haven't really paid attention with these types of glass stoppers if some CO2 gets trapped. But I know with Stelvin or screw cap enclosures, 
you will get a little bit of CO2 trapped inside. So you may get a little bit of spritz, a little bit of bubbles, not like truly sparkling, but like just some bubbles in there when you open those wines. All right, let's check it out. So on the nose, um, I see strawberry and watermelon, which is very, very normal for rosés, really from everywhere. I get a little bit of orange to it. Really just like fresh orange. Some white flowers. But really all the aromas are pretty light. It's not an in-your-face uh, rosé. And like a little bit of like red apple skin type of thing. Let's check it out. <clears throat> so it's dry. I know it has a six grams per liter of sugar, but it's definitely a dry wine. The fruit does come through. And the, on the back end, there was a little bit of that sugar but it's really slight. I get, I guess you get a little bit of cherry now, in addition to the watermelon, red apple, and strawberry. This is super, super easy to drink and refreshing. Um, you know, I had this in the fridge right up until, I don't know, about 20, 30 minutes ago. And um, so it's warming up just a little bit. But again, summer wine goodness. But I'm also a big, I'm also a big proponent of rosé every day, regardless of the time of year or what climate you're in. So, yeah, I mean, living in a place like Texas, it's easy to drink rosé in January because it could be 80 degrees. So even if I was back up in Chicago, <clears throat> rosé. In the middle of winter? Why not, man? So rosé is a great wine for like holiday food. I really like the combination of fruit flavors. Now, they're ripe, but there's a bit of tartness to it. The acidity is really coming through on this. It's not a highly acidic wine, but I mean, it's got some good acidity to it. I mean, think of uh, Total City is 5.8, but the, the pH was under 3.5. I'm going to scroll up a little bit on my notes here so I can remind myself what the acidity was. Our pH is 3.1. I mean, that's really low. The lower the pH, the higher the acid. So, I mean, this is a pretty acidic wine. So, I mean, I really like the wine. It's very tasty, uh, refreshing, it's crisp. And, uh, I mean, if you find this wine somewhere... I say, I say go for it. All right. So, you know, that's going to do it for this episode. If you like this episode, please make sure you hit the like button uh, and subscribe if you haven't already done so on YouTube. Besides that, the best thing you can do for me is to tell your friends about this show. I'll also have links in the description for the wines along with affiliate links uh, for the equipment that I use to produce the show. All right, and stay tuned next week for the penultimate, I love that word, episode of Leet Wine TV.